<laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, is this working all right? Can everybody hear me? Okay, cool. Can you, you can see and hear all at the same time. This is good. Oh, hey, look at that. Yeah, I guess we want to be able to see, yeah. Okay, people can see. All right, I'm a little nervous about that. Okay, hi everybody. You're you're in the right place if you're looking for a uh, talk about the Hancock Door and the uh, theater project that Courtney and I put together. Um, I'm Patrick Gabridge. I am a local playwright. I'm also a, play, a producing artistic director for a company called Plays in Place, and we produce site-specific plays in partnership with museums and historic sites. So. Uh, one of our big projects most recently was called Cato and Dolly that we designed for uh, to be done at the Old State House around an exhibit uh, that's built around the John Hancock door from the Hancock Mansion. So why don't you introduce yourself, Courtney? Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Courtney O'Connor. I am uh, a director with Place in Place. I get to work with Pat on several of his projects. I am the associate artistic director at the New York Stage Company of Boston, and I am uh, a Adjunct professor at Emerson College. And one project that Courtney and I have worked together a few years ago was a play called Blood on the Snow at the Old State House. And so that was about the important meeting that took place on the day after the Boston Massacre. And uh, that was a very. 249 years and like. Five days ago. That's right. <laughs> it'll, that, that play we did twice. We did in 2016 and 2017, and it will be back in 2020 for the 250th anniversary. So that was a lot of fun. And if you get a chance to see it, it it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting project. Um, and that was kind of an interesting project there in that we were actually able to stage a play about an event in the room where it actually happened 250 years ago, which was pretty fun. Uh, in this case, we're talking about the Hancock household a little bit. Um, it all starts with Thomas Hancock, in, in our case. Um, he's a, he's a, a merchant from, uh, his father is a reverend and associated with Harvard and an educated family. But Thomas decides not to go into the family business, not to go to Harvard. Instead, he becomes an apprentice bookbinder, gets into the book, book trade. Uh, which is kind of burgeoning there in the 1720s in, in Boston. And, and he is fabulously successful at it, uh, is able to kind of take over the business where he works and becomes pretty much the, the Jeff Bezos of Boston and then of, 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 of America for a little while. He expands from the bookbinding business into imports of whale oil, rum, and then into real estate. So he, he really is like Jeff Bezos. It's kind of it's interesting. Um, his text messages get released? Hey, there were no text messages released <laughs> for Thomas Hancock. Um, and, and he actually makes a lot of his fortune during uh, the, the war years. Uh, he's able to use lucrative war contacts with the British military that uh, he's supplying them with his ships. And he builds an enormous amount of uh, wealth at a very young age. So in his 20s and 30s, he's super rich. Uh, one of the wars he was involved in supplying was the War of Jenkins' Ear, um, which I still think should win the... I, I had thought which should definitely win the best name for a war award, um, but actually there were, I was at a session earlier today and there was uh, a war of the pig uh, that was, I still think <coughs> war of Jenkins here should build, edge that out a little bit, which turned out was actually a pretty big war, it evolves into the King George's war, and there are actually a, a thousand New Englanders sign up to be part of that war. It's kind of the first time that uh, American colonists are really involved in a foreign war. Um, but anyway, he makes a lot of money in that, and he gets involved in politics as a selectman and is engaged with the community. And like any really, really rich guy, he needs to show it off a little bit. So he builds himself a really big mansion. Um, so he builds the, the Hancock Mansion up on Beacon Hill. At the time, there's nothing up there. There, it's right. You know, it's right across the street from the common, which is not a beautiful park. You know, it's a cow pasture, and there's just essentially no neighbors. Everybody's like, "Why are you going to build up there?" But he had some vision, let's just say, uh, and and so where his house is is right around where the current state house is. At the time, he had no. There were no neighbors. Um, his his nearest westward neighbor doesn't 
doesn't show up until 1768, so like 30 years later when John Singleton Copley builds a house next door. Uh, the builder of this house was Joshua Blanchard, and it's built from Medford granite. Usually we think about Quincy granite around here, but this is Medford granite. And the brownstone or, uh, ornamentation was from Connecticut. It was a pretty big house, and later it gets additional wings and a ballroom that are added, and they're later removed. Um, but as he's kind of uh, expanding and showing himself off, he's got this beautiful house, he's buying some slaves, uh, so he is, he is all the trappings. He is enjoying being a, a, wealthy, a wealthy man. Um, in uh, 1737, John Hancock is born, not to Thomas Hancock, but to Thomas's brother. Uh, Thomas's brother, uh, John, uh, dies in 1744. And so our John Hancock, the one that we're all familiar with, um, <coughs> he, he's fatherless. Uh, his mother is trying to figure out, you know, how is she going to support her sons? And Thomas and Lydia, so Thomas has married his wife Lydia, they're childless and they decide to adopt John Hancock, even though his mother's still alive and takes him in as their son and teaches him the family business. So they show him all the ins and outs of how to do this, legal and illegal, there might be some smuggling involved, let's just say. Uh, and, and so he learns how to be a, a world-class merchant and basically is taking over the house of Hancock. When, go ahead. The, the, Thomas and Lydia adopting him, I mean, this was sort of a fairly common practice yes. at the time, even though his mother is still alive. Yep. For the wealthier family to sort of say, okay, we're going to take this one child because we don't have any heirs. You've got too many children and you need help. It was a fairly yeah. common practice. Yep, and, and continues uh, into the 1800s. When I talk later today about Charlotte Cushman, she does that for her sister's son. Yeah. She takes him in as and adopts him as her heir. And that's in the 17, I mean, in the uh, that would have been in the 1840s to I 50s. Know, there's all sorts, not, not here, but... Uh, I know in uh, like Regency England and all, there were all sorts of naming conventions where you would try and name your child after that wealthy relative in the hopes that they would go, oh, this one's named after me. I'm going to adopt that. I like that one better. Even if both parents were still alive. Pride and Prejudice, we can talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, it's all the same kind of time, right? John was the oldest, right? Uh, I I think John is the oldest. Uh, yeah, cause Ebony, I think Ebenezer is younger, and I'm trying to remember if they have other living siblings. Yeah, but I think there's only the two boys. So, uh, oh, we have a question oh. for you. Was the, I happened to be at the door the other day. Was the house built in 1737 the same year that John was born? Uh, the house is being built 37 to 39-ish. So, yeah, so the door is around, <coughs> is around the same time. Exactly. Uh, and so when Thomas dies in 1764, he does leave a will that ends up being useful for our project, actually. And, and so the house is left to Lydia, and she instantly transfers ownership over to John with the proviso that he take care of her uh, into her old age. Um, and Thomas died at the state. That's yeah, so John, Thomas died, collapses at the old state house and then is carried home through the door that we write a play about, uh, and, and actually dies at home. But he collapses at the old state house, which is, you know, we're all in the neighborhood, you know. I mean, obviously the house was right up the street from us, uh, and the old state house, which would have been called the townhouse back then, was where they were conducting business. Uh, and John, you know, takes over very well for the, for the business, continues to be really wealthy, puts a lot of that wealth into the revolution, is deeply involved in politics, local politics, is a really popular guy, and really has a, even though he has a certain sense of style. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah. So he, he had a bright yellow canary, like canary yellow coach that he used to ride around town in, and his favorite color was purple, and so he, like, and, and there's, there's a pair of shoes, actually, at the old state house, if you go in, I think the display is still up, but the shoes uh, that he sent to his wife oh, at yeah. the wedding. But, like, you know, he, he's sending her a note going, I don't think you understand how special these shoes are. <laughs> All right, these are really pretty. They're made from this kind of silk. They're, so, you know, the term dandy might be used. There, there might be other sort of, if we were in a different time. Maybe John would have had a different wife. He liked, uh, he liked his no fine wife. stuff. And actually, you can see that carriage is at the yeah. uh, Dorothy Quincy homestead still. But it's, it got turned into a sleigh later. It's not as bright now as it once was. Um, 
So, but he was he was interesting in that he was a really rich guy, but who also had the common touch. He would he spent his money helping make friends. So he would go open a cask of Madeira out on the common after a big deal with the Sons of Liberty. And so people are like, yeah, Thomas, you know, John Hancock, he's our guy. And and you know, he goes on to sign the Declaration of Independence, his president of the Continental Congress. We can say he's our first American president, if you want to. Uh, he's first governor of Massachusetts and is actually uh, um, does not lose an election statewide uh, for governor because he's, he's a three-term governor, but there's one term in between the last and the first two, but he just decides not to run very wisely because the Chase Rebellion happens then and he doesn't really have to take responsibility for it. Uh, so his wife, Dorothy Quincy, was born to Edmund Quincy, who was a, a judge in Braintree. And you can go visit the house where she uh, grew up, which is, it's kind of cool. We took our cast there. It was pretty, it was a pretty fun little field trip. Um, when her mother died, uh, and they were friends of the family because Thomas and Edmund Quincy, uh, Thomas Hancock and Edmund Quincy did business together. So um, when Dolly's mother died in 1769, Aunt Lydia took Dolly under her wing with the hopes that maybe John and Dolly would, would hit it off. And they did, but John wasn't really in a hurry to get married because uh, he's a single bachelor. He's got uh, a, lot of, a lot of cash on hand. Um, but he finally, he doesn't get married until 1775 when they're on the run. So the uh, Battle of Lexington and Concord has happened. They're trying to figure out where to go. They're on the way to Philadelphia. They go to the Thaddeus Burr House in, in Fairfield and kind of stop over. And Aunt Lydia notices Aaron Burr hanging around, who's something of a ladies' man. And she's like, you know, I think you guys need to be married now. So they actually, <laughs> John, and, John and Dolly get married right there at, 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 uh, at the house in Philadelphia. I still would pick Aaron. <laughs> That's only because of the of the Broadway show. I think I think John was was wonderful. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, it's just I think what's kind of cool is that Dolly is someone who's just really involved with um, with the with the life that they were leading and uh, was was important during the war. So. Um, when John dies in 1793, he leaves no will, which is something of a problem, as you could imagine. Um, and you would think someone with all this money would be able to think of some things ahead, but he wasn't always the most organized. But, um, and, and his fortune was a little smaller. He spent a lot of it on the war. Some say as much as $100,000 on the Revolutionary War. So he actually comes out of the war a little bit poorer than he started, but he still is doing okay. How do we know what 100000 would be? I didn't do that calculation. It's a lot. I, I mean, it, would be. it was millions yeah. and millions of dollars. Um, and so Dolly lived in that house still until 1796, and then she married this guy, Captain James Scott, who used to be sail for John Hancock uh, as, a, as a merchant captain. Um, and she moved with him to Portsmouth for a while, and then uh, when he died 12 years later, she moves back, lives there for a while, um, and stays in the family till 1859, there's always fights about it, as families fight over property and money sometimes. Um, but this is kind of cool. Those are actual Hancock relatives in this photo, uh, taken before it's it's going to be demolished. But it falls out of style. It's hard to maintain. And so they, the family tries to sell it to the state of Massachusetts to use as a governor's mansion. Which, and it's, an, it's an iconic home in Boston at this time. It's hard to overestimate how popular... John Hancock was. He's he was he. We could say he was the he was the Tom Brady of the um, <laughs> of, of Boston in, in the six yeah <laughs> in the six uh, yeah. So he was he's a very very popular guy, and they they stayed popular for all this time. And so there was a big kind of question: What should we do with this mansion? Let's turn it into a governor's mansion. Uh, Governor Nathaniel Banks thought, Let, let's we'll, the state will buy it for a hundred thousand dollars. But as you know, there's often there's always been a kind of a split in the state between the rural western part and the urban eastern part, and the western part's like, we're <coughs> not spending this money for you to live in this fancy house. So they, they declined it. And so they couldn't figure out what to do with it. It ends up getting sold to two merchants um, who tear it down and make a brownstone out of it. Part of the property had been sold off earlier to create uh, the west wing of what was now the current state house. Um, and so the, the western part of the current state house is where the Hancock Mansion was. Um, I think only that there's still a few trees there. 
I feel like I heard that. Yeah, and Matt, John, you talked to the to the monument for the school, the Christy uh, Glory Regiment. Okay. It's a marker there. Okay. Go ahead. And when, sorry, when was it torn down again? 1863. Yep. And so before it was demolished, what's cool is this uh, young architect, John Hubbard Sturgis, created a series of measured drawings of the home, um, which is unusual. It was the first set of measured drawings done in, in, in the Americas of an American house. Uh, so it was kind of cool. He's recorded a lot of the detail uh, of what there was, which ends up becoming useful later because there's some reproductions made of this home. Um, not everyone is happy that this house is going to be torn down. So there's like, save the old Hancock Mansion. Um, you know, avoid this act of modern vandalism, but it doesn't work. So uh, it's auctioned off piece by piece. The, supposedly the exterior steps are in, a, in by Jamaica Pond. They're, the interior steps are in a home in Marblehead right now. Um, and if you go to the exhibit now to through the keyhole, there are, are uh, keepsakes that were made out of pieces of the Hancock home. Uh, so that was, it was big. Everybody wanted a piece of this house. Um, but yeah, top to bottom, sold off, torn down, turned into brownstones. Um, and it caused something of an outcry when this thing was torn down. And, and so the positive sense of that is that the, the lack of ability to preserve this home led to the historic preservation movement in Boston and then subsequently in the rest of North America and in the United States. Uh, so that the old state house is preserved and old South Meeting House and the Paul Revere House, they're preserved because we lost the Hancock Mansion. Uh, so those measured drawings came in handy later. Ticonderoga Historical Society built a replica of the house, which we have not been to yet. Someday we're gonna take a little bit down there. It's pretty cool. Um, and there's a, there is, it led to a whole uh, uh, colonial revival movement in architecture. And so this is an example on Fairweather Street in Cambridge. It's hard to see from this. It's easier Governor to see from Weld this. Used to live yeah, Bill Weld used to live in that house. Um, you can see the, the central aspect up here. These uh, pillars uh, are match what was there. So that, that's pretty, it's just pretty neat that's there. You could go look at it right now. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear. So the, the door from the Hancock Mansion happened, was obtained by the Bostonian Society in the late 1800s, 88, 89, and uh, had been in storage for a long time. It had been exhibited a few times, but pretty much in, a, in storage for like 100 years. Uh, and uh, the folks at the, at the Bostonian Society who run the Old State House decided they wanted to do something with it. And Nat Shidley, who's the executive director, and a friend of ours uh, said, you know, I, we can do something with this and it can use the door to illustrate issues of class. And he was really interested in the story of uh, George Robert Twelves Hughes, uh, who was kind of an interesting guy and this is a really great book about it actually. Uh, but, and, and so there's a moment where Hughes as a young man goes and visits also a fairly young John Hancock and there's this kind of moment of noblesse oblige that kind of happens. Uh, and it kind of illustrated a lot of class differences. And uh, Hughes's life kind of shows how those class differences flatten out a little bit as the re revolution progresses. But um, I don't know. It, it, it wasn't enough to make a play out of. <laughs> so and that's we have this interesting charge. Make a play about a door. It's a big, dirty old door. <laughs> a 300-year-old door, which is pretty cool. but. Uh, and so the, the society, Bostonian Society, reached out to the North Bennett Street School, who had done work with them before, and say, you know, we're going to build an exhibit around this door. Could you build a surround for us to make something an exhibit? And they're like, yeah, sure. So they cleaned it up, and I got to be there, and you saw it while yeah. it was being worked on. I actually got to touch the door with Q-tips and, and clean it up a little bit. And I actually got to turn the door over, so I have held the door. Um, I it's a, I <laughs> it's a big, heavy old door. Uh, but what's kind of cool is, uh, so Sarah Chase, who's a historic paint expert, was able to do some research on it. And it turns out that's the original. The paint is historic. So we couldn't, but it also meant that they couldn't do anything to the paint. So they couldn't, it just, it looks like that. But they did build this really cool looking surround. So this is to replicate kind of what it would have looked like from the front of the house. And this is a close-up of one of the, the pillar sculptors that they, these uh, restoration carpentry guys carved by hand. Uh, it's pretty amazing to watch them just away with a hammer and chisel. Um, and then this is the interior side. 
Oh, is that what it was? I think it was $100. Just for each, each one, right? Maps. It was pretty, they worked really hard. Yeah. Um, and then so they built this side of it, sort of showing the inside, and this is where we are gonna make a play. We had a charge to create all it. All of the, uh, all the metal, all of the, the um, hardware. The hardware, thank yeah. you. All of that is original. Yeah, the hardware was original. You were able to determine that, uh, which was pretty cool. Um, so yeah, so we had a charge. We could make a play about a door, but we couldn't. Touch the door. Or open the door or go through the door. <laughs> no, no, how hard could it be? Um, uh, so, yeah, that was a little, and we, so we had 20. platform that was about a foot and a half wide. I know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why they built the larger platform on the side that no one was ever going to step on. And our side got like the tiny little platform, but that's okay. We can, you know, we're used to dealing with challenges, so that'd be fine. Um, and the task was to write a play dealing with unheard voices. Um, from history and uh, and and uh, through this household, through this door, how can we create something around this? A twenty-minute play that would be part of a regular museum experience. So different from Blood on the Snow, which was a separate event. This is going to be something you would go to the museum and oh look, there's a play happening. Let's go watch it. Uh, so it had to happen really fast. I think we got the go ahead April first. <clears throat> we had the show open by July sixth. Which meant we had to read, research and write it. I got to go ahead to write it. Right. Yeah, I got to go ahead to write it. I had to have, I, we got to go ahead April 1st. I think we had to have a script by May 4th. So it was, <laughs> I don't recommend that time frame to anybody. Uh, but I got a big bunch of research, and, and the Boston Lane Society is, has just super smart people working there. It was cool. We had access to some original documents. So, like, this is an invoice for a watch repair. <coughs> Um, but the first thing we had to do is figure out who's this going to be about. We knew it wasn't going to have a lot of people, probably two characters. Um, so we were... Unlike Blood on the Snow, we didn't just want it to be white men. Right. right we, Blood on the Snow had one character of color in it, but we knew that we wanted to, you know, the old state house wanted to explore different voices, but we knew that as well, but we didn't want to cast. Right, and we had a whole different charge right. to, to show unrepresented voices and to show it wasn't going to be a totally realistic play we knew going in because we're not in the room where this happened we just have the door there so it's going to be a different kind of structure <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> so um as going through the research I, and we knew it was going to be a small cast so i was limited to, we were like it's gonna be two people so dolly hancock kind of sprang to life right away in the writings it's interesting she's lesser known because she wasn't a prolific writer like Abigail Adams, um, so and she wasn't quite as obviously influential as the Martha Jefferson, Martha Washington, but she was really important. And she was she was there during the Continental Congress when they were working on the Declaration of Independence, um, helping. You know, Hancock. There was very little secretarial support during this time in Philadelphia, so they would be doing handling paperwork till late in the night. And of course, the, the male historians, when they're writing these books, I'm like, I'm working out the numbers. I'm like, oh, she was pregnant while she was doing all this. So she's like six, seven months pregnant while handling all the paperwork that John is having to sign around the declaration. Uh, it, was, it, was pretty, it was pretty crazy. Um, so she endured a lot that was not atypical for what women went through at that time, too, in that she lost uh, both her children uh, to... Sorry, yeah. <laughs> she loses two husbands. I'm ruining the whole thing. You still just come see the show. Um, <laughs> but, and also, she was involved as a hostess in ways that really mattered uh, in a scene that got cut from the play, but I get to tell you about it anyway. Um, <laughs> so the Battle of Newport uh, goes terribly. Hancock is its first kind of his involvement. He's been a general in the militia forever, and so he kind of goes down, and it goes really, they, they're terrible. He's not a good soldier. Um, and there's a storm that comes up, so the British Navy comes out ahead of the French, and so the French have to retreat, and so they go to refit themselves, their, their ships in Boston. And, and during the conflict around Newport, the Admiral d'Estaing, the French Admiral, Admiral was um, horribly insulted, uh, as he felt, uh, by one of the American military officers. So he was like, Screw these people! I'm taking my ships and going home. I don't. I don't need to be part of this. And so they're they're there to get their ships fixed up in Boston, and then they're going back, and they're going to tell the king we should not do this war anymore. We really don't need to be here. So in in the in a weird way that people don't talk about, there's a lot held on the balance, and when this is happening, it's late in the war, um, and um, Dolly Hancock ends up conducting this pretty much month long dinner party for the French at their house. Uh, 
feeding them breakfast, lunch, and dinner here and there. <laughs> There's stories of her like just sending people onto the common, like you know, from any cow that you can, you know, like every yeah. vet, like anything that they could to just feed yeah. this mass number of people. Yeah, um, so so I kind of call it the dinner party that saved America, uh, and then she really made it happen. And then this other guy, Cato, this uh, person who was an enslaved man in the Hancock household um, from fairly early in his life, uh, and then after he's freed via Thomas Hancock's will at age 30, he remains in the household. Um, and this was kind of curious, like, why does he stay? But he shows up in a bunch of stories. He shows up in a bunch of documents. We're able to find baptismal records for his children and some marriage certificates. So we know a bit about him. It's, it's hard to find information about people who are servants or slaves. It's a little easier to find information about slaves sometimes because, because their property things are recorded about them that are not necessarily recorded about servants. But we knew a lot about him. So he became the next obvious person to put in this. So, you know, I still had to create a lot. The little mentions of him, too. Like yeah, you said, like, like you know, we see care of preparing his care watch. Cato's watch. The, there's a letter that John sends back right from, uh, or when he's, back when he's in, you know, when John is visiting London of, like, you know, what he sends back to Cato as a, as a present. For yeah, him. sends so him a I French mean, horn. Right, so so there's there's like he, he just sort of kept popping up in small, unexpected ways. Yeah, and he, there's some stories that we illustrate in the in the play, and then there's there's one he's actually in the incident around the Liberty, uh, early right before the war starts, uh, and so Cato is supposedly there. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting things going on. Um, so we put together a cast for this two-person play. It was, it was a little complicated because we were going to run for the entire summer. So we ran, uh, I don't know, 12 weeks, 12 I think. 12 weeks, uh, three times. Three days a week, three, three times a day. Three times so 112 day. performances or so. Uh, so it was, a, it was a lot of shows, So which meant that we couldn't just have one Cato and one Dolly. We needed to have. We had wound up with three Dollies and two Catos. <laughs> and they were all prepared to sort of mix and match. Uh, we tried to keep it to like week-long sessions so that they weren't switching every day. And I don't think, and, and every once in a while we had a day where we would switch, but I don't think we ever switched performers midday, which no. is what we were hoping to avoid. We did. Did we? Yeah. There were some, that. because we had one guy, because Felton was in a show. That's right. So we had one guy who was in a show at the Lyric, so he would he could do the morning show for us and had to go be in another show in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, Using Kiss of the Spider Woman. That's right. So, yeah, you should talk about the rehearsal process because it was somewhat unusual to refer, uh, rehearse so many people for the same exact roles. It was it was very challenging, especially because we were creating this play for the first time, you know. And, and like Pat said, the the charge to do it was so quick that we were still working the script and figuring out. There was a scene that was in the play up until about two days before we opened. And we and we all finally <laughs> said, okay, we love this scene, but it has to be cut. But oh, yeah. so yeah, George and the oh, I missed them. George and, and <laughs> you know, it was a great scene. They were like our contemporary, you know, hardcore Southie people in their morning John Hancock. Ah, oh, Johnny. Ah, oh, Johnny. Ah, um, <laughs> oh, Maya. Or ah, oh, Governor Hancock. Uh, it was great, but we had to let it go. But we had these five actors, and you know, actors normally get very protective of their parts in a rehearsal process because you're figuring it out and it's new. And our actors couldn't quite do that because we, we had so little time to put all this together that they had to be open and communicating with each other. And because they were going to be mixing and matching who they were performing with, we essentially all stayed in the room together the entire time. So, you know, oftentimes if you have two actors playing a part, they won't really watch the other one rehearse in order to make it their own. We just had to stay together, and we set out from the beginning that it was never about competition. It was always about coming up with what was best while letting it be individualized. So Marge's, you know, Dolly could be different than Margaret's, and that could be different than Becca's. But if one had a really great idea, we were going to steal it and use it for all of them. Like there was a moment during a different dinner party where there was a china plate that uh, we would hand to a member of the audience to hold. And one of the actors figured out that if she looked at an audience member, they would clink the plate for us when we needed them to. And so, and so we were immediately like, great, all the dollies are clinking the plate with the audience. Going. So it was a really unique 
experience, it was challenging because we couldn't just do anything once. We had to do it a minimum of six times because you had to rehearse it with each set of actors, or I guess a minimum of five, but like we had to do each pair of <laughs> actors. So it was really challenging. But it was really cool, and I think it, we, it was important to have a director that could kind of set up that, that relationship between people. Um, but yeah, so we performed it a lot of times, for, and for small audiences, but appreciative audiences. So we, can, we could fit about 35 people there at a time in the gallery with us. Um, and so in the, in the play, they play a lot of different roles. Like I said, we, we chose to go with a non-realistic kind of presentation, and so they're playing over time. The, the play ranges from the 1850s all the way till in the early 19, 1800s. They both play Aunt Lydia. Uh, Dolly also plays John Hancock. Kano plays Captain Scott. He plays uh, Little Johnny George Washington. Little Johnny George Washington Hancock, which is one of the great names ever. Uh, he <laughs> plays uh, Lafayette. He plays <coughs> Sam Adams. So they, they played a bunch of different characters between the two of them. And uh, like Pat said, the difference between this and, and Blood on the Snow, one of the differences, was that this audience didn't necessarily know they were coming to see the play. These were families and people out walking the Freedom Trail or visiting Boston who came into the museum, saw that there was a show, and sat down. And, you know, we were nervous about that because we, we were prepared that people, you know, they're coming in, they're not thinking they're going to sit down and spend 22, 23 minutes watching something. We figured we'd have a lot of people getting up and leaving. We figured we'd have a lot of disgruntledness. There was none of that. Yeah, it was it was surprising. It's funny because we talked last year just as the show was opening, yeah. uh, and it turned out it was much more successful than we had even hoped. Yeah. I think in terms of engaging audiences, and it was a great example of how museums can use theater to engage audiences with history and historical figures uh, in a way that just really brought them in and gave a new relationship, and also changes your relationship to an object in your collection. So, uh, you know, we talked, I remember Sarah Glidden was there and we were doing a talk back after and she had said, you know, if I had come in to see this exhibit without the play, I would have said, you know, nice door and maybe read the label and that was it. But if you go and then see the play, it has a whole new meaning. So now when the people that have gone through that and several thousand people came through that last summer, uh, you know, they really had a different relationship to these people and to this object and to, we're really much more willing to engage with the questions that we are raising around that. Um, so now the play will be coming back uh, June 17th to August 11th, and it's gonna be running seven days a week, three times a day. So <laughs> you'll have plenty of chances to see it. I think we're running 169 <laughs> performances. Uh, so a yeah, it, it'll be a lot of fun. So we have to, this goes till 12.30, right? Yes. Okay, and sure. I would like to point out, at no time did the actors touch. Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, not, though. The security cameras show that other people did. Yeah. People, are, people are crazy in museums. Um, it, but it is most of the same cast. At least three out of the five are coming back. We're waiting for one more. And so we'll have a new, one of the new Cato's will be there. So we're actually looking for that person right now. With, with having it seven days a week, we have to structure it differently. Uh, but it really, I mean, it's, it's one of the great things is that consistency and that number of performances really makes this a viable financial option for, for the actors. So it's allowing us to sort of structure it differently in a way that is really appealing for the same actors to return as much as possible. Right, and the museum found that it was really working for them. So that they've really made a commitment after the shows that we've done there um, to do this kind of work. And, and long ongoing. Because Courtney and I would do this kind of work other places too. So like we have a show, two shows at Mount Auburn Cemetery that we'll be working on in June and September of this year as well. Uh, so if you like that place, I'm gonna talk about that after lunch. But um, awesome. yeah, so we do all kinds of stuff like that. But yeah, so do people have questions <coughs> about, yeah, yeah. So then who pays for this? Because it sounds like the actors are, are paid. Everybody's paid. Volunteers. We are not volunteers. Okay, and so then who's, it is the Bostonian Society paying? Okay. Yep. So I would say all the institutions that we work with have different methods of funding things. So, so for example, Blood on the Snow, people were buying tickets, right, right. and so that was and that was sold out every night for one week, uh, twelve weeks of a whole summer. Um, so it was very popular, and so that helped offset a lot of the costs. But it's still theater is expensive, but so is building exhibits. So, and that's the thing museums keep in, need to keep in mind is that people don't build exhibits for free. Um, and this is the same kind of thing. And it, 
does a huge level of engagement. And so the museum has to decide if they're committing to have that be part of their budget. In this case, they've decided multiple times that this is worthwhile for them. The, the museum has had an interpretive characters program for a number of years, and they were feeling, I think, I think it's fair to say, dissatisfied with the connection that they were having, especially in comparison to this. And so I think that that helped sort of them say, okay, we're going to allocate some of the resources that we would usually put towards that program towards bringing this in because they felt this was much, uh, at least in its current iteration of the of their interpretive characters, that this was connecting with audiences. And right, and they're revamping stuff. that program and doing <coughs> things that are a little more theatrical is the, is the plan, so they have some new, new plans there. Um, so, more questions about the history, John Hancock, Cato Hancock, yeah, yeah. Uh, John Hancock's grandfather was minister in Lexington. Right, yep. Uh, before he was adopted, uh, did he live in Lexington as a young boy for a short period? Yeah, yeah. So be, be in the time after when John's father died, right. then uh, his mother and the boys all went to live with the grandfather in Lexington. Yeah. And so in that home is the one that, uh, right, at, at the Hancock House, right. uh, uh, where outside the Battle of Lexington and Concord. And so actually Dolly was in that house during the battle. Um, okay. she, she witnesses the Battle of Lexington and Concord from the window of that house because John and Samuel Adams have left already, mm -hmm. uh, but they leave the women behind actually to secure all the stuff and the papers and stuff well, like that. I have another quick short sure. question. Yeah, yeah. Jonas Clark, the minister of Lexington in April 1775. I have read somewhere, but I can't establish it, that his wife was John Hancock's sister. Do you have any information on that? I can't remember. Jonas Clark's wife. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me, but I'm... The, that, that somehow the link connection was made that that is how he stayed in touch with Jonas Clark through, okay. through his sister. Okay, <coughs> I'll, I'll have to uh, check. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. Okay, yeah, well, good question. Reverend Clark's house? Yeah, yeah, no, that's the house that they're at. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I don't know if, but was uh, was he married to his sister? I don't know. So, yep. Um, so, uh, how, how much of the information about Cato um, sort of was available, I guess, after John Hancock died? Is there any documentation or references? No. So, we got to make up a lot. In, I, in, I was curious, like, there's no indication that he moved to Portsmouth. There's some, and it gets confusing because Cato is a popular name for slaves in Boston prior to the end of slavery in 1804, 1808. Um, so um, there is, we think there was more than one Cato Hancock. We think Ebenezer Hancock <laughs> also had a Cato, Cato Hancock. And so Cato Hancock shows up in a couple uh, town records around marriages and stuff late in the game. And so we were unclear which one, which Cato Hancock that is. So we don't know. We we're pretty sure that he's buried in Boston. He could have gone, um, but it, that was hard. It was hard to know. What we do know is he wasn't involved in like some of the petitions made to the state. <coughs> Uh, he's not well, like he's not hanging out with Prince Holmes and signing those petitions. He does not that we can know start a business. So we're at, we're asked any, but we know about when he dies, uh, which is shortly after Dolly Hancock moves out of the house. Uh, so there's a lot of suppositions we kind of had to do. But there's kind of guesses we can things like, oh, here's some things he didn't do. He didn't own his own business. He didn't go to jail. He didn't do a bunch of things, and we think he stayed in the in the area. Well, one of the interesting things that happened was that we knew his the names of his children because Lydia insisted that they all be baptized. And so we have the baptismal records where it's listed as right, the Cato Church. Hancock, John Hancock's servant, and his, and his children's names and their baptism dates. Right. Well, we didn't have his... We were confused about which... There were a couple options for what his wife's name could have been. And then we, we do, we're doing the show, and a guy shows up who's related to John Hancock via Ebenezer, and he's got, he, honest to God, he shows up at the show with research in his pocket. He's like, oh, I've got this and this and this. And then we had gotten the, the name wrong for Cato's wife. And so we changed it, like, on the spot. Like, we were, I think, 
it was probably the 11 o'clock show we saw him at the 12:30 show. The name had been changed, which is cool. What's cool about doing theater is that you know you can you can make those things. We talked to the actor. I'm like, are you ready for this? He's like, yeah, it's done. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Stephen's great. So he was really wonderful. Yeah. Nothing. It's the weirdest darn thing. Why not talk about Frank? I think it's a good question. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm combing through the stories and the, the books and everything, and Frank really does not show up very much. Um, so why is he buried next to John Hancock? I don't know. Um, and why is Cato not? Well, I mean, Cato dies much, much later than John, so that could be why. Um, yeah, there's there's not a lot about Frank, but Cato shows up in these stories around. Um, Admiral Destang around the dinner parties. There's no mention stuff. of Frank and Thomas's will because we've seen the will. Right. Yeah. So. So yeah. Cato's. During uh, John's time. Yeah. So it's yeah. just. Yeah. I. I don't. I don't know. And I. We had gotten a tiny glimmer from some another scholar who had come last year about Frank, but not. There's not. We don't have a lot. We did not have a lot of information about him. So it, it, sometimes at the history camp, you'll find people, someone's going to be sitting here who's like, I know all about Frank. Um, but yeah, it was weird. It's kind of the obvious thing, like, why isn't it Frank? But, uh, but Cato ended up being our guy. Yep. Do you guys have something else on the horizon right now, or are there objects that you're blessed to <laughs> uh, Not right now. M Mount Auburn is the, th that's going to keep us pretty busy. We have two sets of five plays each. So there's going to be five plays around the natural environment in June, and then five plays around American history and American identity in September. Uh, and so those are plays where you'll go and the audience will move from site to site to site to site uh, around the cemetery. Uh, and it's a pretty, it's a pretty big undertaking. Yeah. Though we're always looking for new ones. So we're in talks with a couple other museums about uh, potential projects right now. Um, and we're always looking for more, so. If you're looking, <laughs> you never know. Uh, yeah, and we do this kind of work a lot. Cool. All right. Any other questions? Good job. Great.